The first Western visitor, F. H. Humphreys, an English police officer, described its effect in a letter to a friend in England. On reaching the cave, we sat before him at his feet and said nothing. We sat thus for a long time, and I felt lifted out of myself. For half an hour I looked into the Maharshi's eyes, which never changed their expression of deep contemplation. I could feel only that his body was not the man. It was the instrument of God, merely a sitting, motionless corpse from which God was radiating terrifically. My own feelings were indescribable. In 1902, one Shiva Prakasam Pillai happened to come to Tiruvannamalai on government work. After hearing of the young sage, he immediately went up the hill to see him and was captivated on his very first visit. He put fourteen questions, and since the Swami was still observing silence, both questions and answers were in writing. These answers were later expanded and arranged in book form as Who Am I? This small book containing his early teachings remains the essence of all instruction ever given. Altogether outstanding among the early devotees of the Swami was the great scholar and ascetic popularly known as Ganapati Muni. He was a man of towering ability, a child prodigy in Sanskrit, a phenomenal memory, a man of intense sincerity, natural humility, and devotion. His very presence evoked awe and respect. In 1903, as a young man of 25, he moved to Tiruvannamalai, thinking it a good place to perform austerities. By the year 1907, doubts began to assail him. And one hot afternoon, with great agitation, he ran up the hill to the Swami, fell at his feet, and with a voice quivering with emotion said, All that has to be read I have read. Even Vedanta Shastra I have fully understood. I have performed japa to my heart's content, yet I have not up to this time understood what tapas is. Therefore, I have sought refuge at your feet. Pray enlighten me as to the nature of tapas. The Swami turned his silent gaze upon him for some fifteen minutes, and then replied, If one watches whence the notion I arises, the mind is absorbed into that. That is tapas. When a mantra is repeated, if one watches the source from which the mantra sound is produced, the mind is absorbed in that. That is tapas. These instructions and the overwhelming grace he felt emanating from the Swami filled him with unspeakable joy. He began composing Sanskrit verses on the Swami and declared to all that henceforth the Swami is to be addressed as Bhagavan Sri Ramana Maharshi. Immediately the name Ramana came into use, so also did the title Maharshi, which means Great Seer. But gradually the epithet Bhagavan began to prevail among his devotees. It simply means divine. In 1916, Ramana's mother, Aragamal, came to Aranachala with the resolve to spend the rest of her life with her ascetic son. Her eldest son had died. The wife of Nagasundaram, her youngest son, also died, leaving behind a baby boy. Nagasundaram left his son with his childless sister, Alamelu, joined his mother and sage brother, and donned the ochre robes of a renunciate. Soon after his mother's arrival, Ramana moved from Virupaksha cave to Skanda Ashram, a little higher up the hill. Mother took charge of the ashram kitchen and received intense training in spiritual life from her son, whom she now came to look upon as a divine being. During her last years at Skanda Ashram, she intuitively realized that her salvation depended on her son, who was now her sole refuge.
she refused to leave his company even for a day, fearing she might die away from him. She told him, it doesn't matter if you throw my dead body in the thorny bushes, but I must die in your arms. And in his arms she was on that fateful day of May 19th, 1922. And by his special touch, she attained the final state of absorption in the heart before she breathed her last. Sri Kunju Swami, who witnessed the mother's last hours at Skanda Ashram, describes the scene. On that last day, from five o'clock, there was a premonition that this was mother's final day. Bhagavan sat by her side and put one hand on her chest and the other on her head. Bhagavan was advising everyone to go and eat because if she died, it was considered unclean by Orthodox people to eat in a house where a death had occurred. Some of the Orthodox ones amongst us went and ate, but others who felt particularly close to Bhagavan didn't think about leaving him to go and eat. Bhagavan continued to sit by mother's side and kept his hands on her. Different expressions of joy and sorrow were passing over her face. Bhagavan was commenting, Is mother in this world? No. She is in different worlds, going through various births and the consequent experiences. When her passing seemed imminent, people like Ganapati Muni, T.K. Sundaresha Iyad, and others decided to recite from the Vedas. On the other side, Sharanagati Ramaswami and a Punjabi gentleman started reciting Rama Japa. Without any forethought, we joined in with the singing of Akshara Manamalai and Arunachala Shiva. Amidst this loud singing and reciting of various scriptures, Mother left the body. Still, Bhagavan continued to keep his hands on her heart and head. We wondered why he was still seated like that. Then he explained, when Paini Swami was breathing his last, I did the same thing. I thought the soul had subsided in the heart and removed my hands. He opened his eyes and the life force left through the eyes. So this time, to be certain, I am keeping the hands on longer than needed. I learned this important secret from Bhagavan that day. He then got up and we all ate. After eating, we gathered again near the body without any feeling of pollution. Ganapati Muni had raised the question about the possibility of a woman attaining the state of realization in Ramana Gita. Bhagavan had said that the state of realization does not relate to the form of the gross body. So we all felt satisfied that mother had attained liberation and were happy. Happier indeed because we saw that mother's face and body were now radiating such luster and light. The mother's body was carried down to the foot of the southern slope and buried with all the ceremony and rites according to a liberated soul. Agyani. A shrine was erected over the grave, and the Maharshi would visit it almost daily. His brother took up residence there, and on one occasion a few months later, the Maharshi came down and settled there too. The devotees from Skanda Ashram followed him, 
and thus was founded Sri Ramanashramam. At first there was only a thatched hut built over the mother's grave. But as seekers and devotees began pouring in from all over India and abroad, buildings were constructed to accommodate them. A 40 by 15 foot hall was built to house the Maharshi, and although he preferred every sort of simplicity, a couch was forced upon him. This became his home for most of the 24 hours of the day. He adhered to a punctual routine, which included going out for a stroll twice a day. At these times he would walk up on the slopes of his beloved Arunachala Hill, and if any attachment to anything could be said of him, it was surely an attachment to the hill. He loved it and said it was God himself, the spiritual heart or center of the earth. He seemed to never be so happy as when wandering around its slopes, and once remarked that there was not one spot on the hill where he had not set his foot. He also encouraged devotees to walk around the eight-mile circumference of the hill, as it has been well known from ancient times to be a very potent spiritual exercise. Generally, the Maharshi appeared to be indifferent, a witness to what was going on around him. Nevertheless, he was always aware of what was happening and seemed to be very particular about certain matters. First of all, he insisted that he should be accessible to devotees and visitors at all times, even on the day of his death when he had no strength to even hold his head erect. He asserted that devotees should not be prevented from seeing him. He was also very keen that visitors should be fed immediately upon their arrival, and food should be well cooked and nutritious. He participated and supervised meal preparations for many years. The Maharshi was adamant that no preferences should be given to him in way of food or conveniences. If it is good for me, it must be good for all, he would say, when some special food preparation or medicine was offered him. He would then make the attendants distribute the item to everyone present before he would take it himself. In his company, one would notice a total absence of distinction between men and women of different castes and creeds, of different races and religions, between a prince and a peasant, an ascetic and a householder. His equality extended far beyond human beings and embraced even plants and animals. His love for and affinity with animals can be compared only to that wonderful child of Christ, St. Francis of Assisi. They all came to him, dogs, snakes, monkeys, crows, deer, peacocks, chipmunks and cows, to name a few. Their silent language was known to him, and when he spoke, they understood and obeyed. He arbitrated the monkeys' quarrels. He has been known to speak to the wild leopards and cobras, and the whole animal kingdom accepted him as their guardian and defender. All felt his grace and acted with intelligence in his presence. He considered every living creature as equal, and those who came to him deserved an equal share to the land and resources of Ramanashrama. He often mentioned that this was their territory all along, and we humans have just come and occupied it, if they could speak, they would claim their rights as well. Besides this, he maintained that every creature, from man down to the smallest insect, was an equal manifestation of the Supreme Self, the imperishable One. And even an animal can progress spiritually and on rare occasions attain liberation. This was demonstrated in the life of the cow Lakshmi. For over twenty years she lived in the ashram and exhibited a rare devotion to Bhagavan and intelligence in all matters. 
Bhagwan fully reciprocated her gentle devotion, and on her last day, when her end was near, he went to her. Ama, mother, he said, you want me to be near you? He sat down beside her and took her head in his lap. He gazed into her eyes and put his hand on her head and also over her heart. Holding his cheek against hers, he caressed her. Satisfied that her heart was pure and centered on God, he left her. Shortly after, she left her body quite peacefully. She was buried with full ceremony, and a stone bearing her likeness was erected over her grave. An epitaph written by Bhagavan was engraved thereon, stating that, in fact, she attained final liberation on that day. The Maharshi was always very tidy and clean. He was invariably punctual, and his frugality was flawless. Nothing ever went to waste. He was often seen bending over to retrieve a lone grain of rice and return it to its proper place. Whatever work he performed, he did with full concentration, with greater speed and perfection than anyone could match. And all the attention lavished on him didn't affect him. He never wanted anything from anyone. He was fully satisfied with the pristine fullness of the Supreme Self. As for human attributes, his personality and character bordered perfection. But his most outstanding feature was not human. It was divine. It was that divine, transforming quality of his presence that attracted thousands to him from all corners of the world. His very presence, his silence, quelled the agony of many hearts and transported mature souls to the realm of spiritual fulfillment, self-realization. Let us listen to a not-so-uncommon experience of one such seeker, Ramani Amal. Bhagwan 's look was real magic. You could not do anything, but just looking into his eyes transformed you into Samadhi. Everyone in the hall used to feel Bhagwan was looking at them alone. This is the true experience of each one of us. In his inimitable way, he was giving the glance of grace to each and every one seated in the hall. Bhagwan 's look used to take us deep into Samadhi. Just by looking into his eyes, you came to know what meditation is. This is the common experience of all devotees. You ask anyone, and you will get the same reply. Once he gave me such a look, and for a very long time I was absorbed in samadhi. Bhagwan was reading the newspaper, letters were being brought in, normal activity was going on, but I was oblivious of the happenings outside of me. In fact, I was unaware of my body. The sincere seekers flocked to him, and the intensity of their sincerity was reciprocated in full in an unseen manner, known only to the seeker. He explained to the devotees that although one may see varied visions, hear supernatural sounds, experience clairvoyance, even develop occult powers such as invisibility, the materialization of objects and so forth, it is not until the mind is perfectly silenced and sunk into the heart, the seat of the Supreme Self, can the final truth be realized and perfection attained. With or without visions, his guidance would take them beyond the limitations of body and mind and awaken the pure awareness of the self in the heart. Professor N. R. Krishnamurti Ayer, an ardent senior devotee of the Maharshi, recalls his experiences while sitting before the Master in 1934. Sometime about the midnight, the, I was simply, I never moved about 
I simply stayed where I was. I was unconscious of what or what things were happening around. The light, just you have seen light from a concave mirror being focused with a parallel beam. When you project on a concave mirror, it is focused on a point, focal point. That focal point was your. At that focal point, all that light was drained. The heart was opened. The Kundalini Sakti was completely sucked into that heart. That was Sita Varunachala, Ramana. And there, when the opening, the open, usually heart is closed. And the heart open. I never knew any of these things. I have never read any theory. These are all practical experiences. And throughout the night, immediately, there gushed forth a flood of nectar from the heart. It drenched every pore of my skin. It drenched my whole physical system. It poured out, 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 went on coming out in great floods. The whole universe was filled. The fun of it was, my awareness was not in the body. My awareness was over the whole of the space filled by that nectar. The whole universe was nectar. Nectar, I call it ether. You may give it a name, something very subtle. But alert with awareness at every point. And that all the bodies there, living and non-living, were simply like flakes, snowflakes, floating in that portion of nectar. If you ask me what is my body, my body was the whole universe of nectar. By his look and the power of his presence, he affected subsidence of the mind and the experience of the one perfect reality. He often said that the true teaching was in silence. But this does not mean verbal expositions also were not given. And although he authorized many different methods of spiritual practice, he, however, laid the greatest emphasis on the path of self-inquiry. The first and foremost of all thoughts that arise in the mind is the primal I thought. It is only after the rise or origin of the I thought that innumerable other thoughts arise. Search by means of a deeply introverted mind wherefrom this I arises. If we go inward questing for the source of the I, the I topples down and immediately another entity will reveal itself proclaiming I, I. Even though it also emerges saying I, it does not connote the ego, but the one perfect existence. People of all religions came to him, and he never advised any of them to change their faith or abandon their creeds. He answered all their questions patiently, but in the end brought them round to the self. Know who you are, then all else will be known, he would say. To a question put to him about happiness, he replied, Happiness is your real nature. You identify yourself with the body and mind, feel its limitations, and suffer. Realize your true self in order to open the store of unalloyed happiness. That true self is the reality, the supreme truth, which is the self of all the world you now see, the self of all the selves, the one real, the supreme, the eternal self, as distinct from the ego or the bodily idea for the self. He never advised anyone to renounce their families or move to the forest. The obstacle is the mind, he would say. It must be got over whether at home or in the forest. And why should your occupation or duties in life interfere with your spiritual effort? By giving up activities is meant giving up attachment to activities or fruits thereof, giving up the notion, I am the doer. The practice of his teaching doesn't require outward rituals or ceremony. 
It takes one straight to the source of one's own being, which is the source from whence all religions spring and must ultimately resolve. It can be practiced by men and women of all walks of life, regardless of their environment. The Maharshi lived what he taught. In fact, his life was the most perfect demonstration of the supreme state of self-realization. And although he was fixed in the permanent state of pure awareness, his body was subject to the laws of nature. In time, it became afflicted with rheumatism and weakened with age. Early in 1949, a small nodule appeared below the elbow of his left arm. It was surgically removed. It later reappeared and was diagnosed as a malignant tumor, which inch by inch ate up the flesh of his left arm, poisoned his blood, and finally rang down the curtain on a life of immaculate purity and grace. Throughout his final year, there appeared to be terrible suffering, but the Maharshi never complained. He seemed to be indifferent alike to the existence or non-existence of the body, being almost unaware of it. Devotees, seeing his gradual weakening and ominous symptoms, expressed their agony at his impending departure. He simply told them that they attached too much importance to the body, indicating that his influence was not limited to the diseased body they saw before him. When on April 13, 1950, a physician brought him some special medicine, he refused it, saying, it is not necessary, everything will come right within two days. The next day, a long crowd filed past the open doorway. The disease-racked body they saw there was shrunken, the ribs protruding, the skin blackened. It was a pitiable vestige of pain. And yet, at some time during these last days, each received a direct, luminous, penetrating look of recognition, which was felt as a parting infusion of grace. They say that I am dying but I'm not going away. Where could I go? I am here. He repeated this several times, implying clearly that the end of his body would not interrupt the grace and guidance. And that evening, moments before the end came, unexpectedly, a group of devotees sitting outside the hall began singing Aranachala Shiva. On hearing it, Sri Bhagwan's eyes opened and shone. He gave a brief smile of indescribable tenderness. From the outer edges of his eyes, tears of bliss rolled down. One more deep breath, and no more. There was no struggle, no spasm, no other sign of death. Only that the next breath did not come. At that very moment, an enormous star trailed slowly across the sky and disappeared behind the holy Arunachala hill. Many saw it, even as far away as Madras, and felt what it portended. It was exactly 8.47 p.m., April 14, 1950. Next day, a pit was dug and the body interred with divine honors. The crowd, packed tight, looked on in silent grief. A lingam of polished black stone, the symbol of Shiva, was consecrated over his tomb. Crowd dispersed. After the first shock of bereavement, devotees slowly began to be drawn back to Tiruvannamalai.
They say that I am dying, but I am not going away. Where could I go? I am here. They quickly discovered how true this was. More than ever, he has become the inner guru, guiding seekers more actively, more directly. The devotees, wherever they may be, find his grace and support, his inner presence, not merely as potent, but even more potent than ever before. And since the disappearance of his bodily form, his name and fame have been growing day by day. Now, in greater numbers, thousands flock to his tomb and feel the powerful influence of his presence. Houses and cottages have sprung up in and around his ashram. temple built over the mother's remains has become surcharged with a palpable spiritual force. The routine adhered to while the Maharshi tenanted his body continues today unchanged. Only the ashram's size and scope has broadened to meet the ever-increasing demand from sincere seekers the world over. He lived his life, emanated his power, enunciated his teachings only to demonstrate to mankind that life has a meaning and purpose, that there is an indestructible reality, an incomparable beauty, a life of perfect peace and bliss within the hearts of all beings. He is the embodiment of that. visit to Sri Ramanashramam intimately binds one to the divine presence of Bhagavan Sri Ramana Maharshi. That presence is in fact all pervasive. It is here and now. It is the self of all. <laughs> Happiness is your real nature. Realize your true self in order to open the store of unalloyed happiness. Ocean of nectar full of grace, engulfing the universe in thy splendor. O Arunachala, the Supreme itself, be thou the sun and open the lotus of my heart in bliss. Vesha Hanada 
स्वात्मदर्शनम ईश दर्शनम स्वात्म आत्म संस्थि स्वात्मदर्शनम आत्म निर्भयात्म निष्ठता ज्ञानवर्जिता ज्ञानहीन चित ज्ञानमस्ति किं ज्ञातुमंतर किं स्वूपमीत्मदर्शने अव्यया भवा पूर्ण चित्सुख परम सुखम विंदती हजी वस्तु दैविक अहमेतक निज विभानक महदिदम तपो रमण वागिय 